This is Afternoon, afternoon. on the Dove. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to Afternoons on the Dove. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. Today, uh, I am particularly uh, honored to have with us in the studio a good friend of mine, Garris Elkins, who pastors Living Water Church here, the Foursquare Church in Medford. He's authored a book, and uh, it's a powerful book, getting um, some really great reviews, Prayers from the Throne of God. So today we're going to be talking about prayer, and uh, we're going to be opening the phone lines a little bit later on. But for a little while this morning uh, or, or this afternoon, we just want to take time to be with Pastor Elkins and just talk to him about the subject of prayer and what God is doing in the church. And Pastor, nice to have you. Nice to be here, Perry. Boy, you, uh, you have uh, really uh, uncorked it. I read the book. And uh, I was fascinated by it. What prompted you to do this? Well, the book uh, emerged out of just a personal word God gave me. I was in a difficult time uh, processing just some things in life, and I found that I was struggling in my prayer um, upwards. And the Lord just said, you know, you're a dual citizen. And I said, what do you mean by that, Lord? And he said, I positioned you in the heavenlies, but I've asked you to live this life here. And, and I honor struggles in prayer from earth to heaven. But I want you to start praying from heaven to earth. I want you to start praying from that reality that will remain. And so he took me into the scriptures, uh, specifically into Ephesians, and where Paul says that we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And I began to process that and what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi when he said, you're dual citizens. Uh, I began to take that, and that word became an, an article that I wrote, and it got some traction on the Internet and some uh, sites that publish things internationally. And then uh, our church family, the Foursquare Church, asked me to do a uh, workshop of this, and I did it in Atlanta. And then after that, my daughter, who is a, uh, uh, a real editor, not just my <laughs> daughter, but a real editor, um, I said, Ann, I think this is supposed to be a book. Do you have time to uh, do the copy and style editing for me? And she says, yeah. And so as a result of that, the book came out, and uh, so there we are, and it's gone out on, uh, in print through Amazon and on a Kindle. Now. Well, you know, when I started to read the book, and I started to try to wrap my head around praying from up to down. Right, right. It took me, yeah. in fact, I had to go back through that a couple of times. Yeah. I thought, am I reading this right? Are you yeah. asking me to sit up there and look yeah. down here yeah. and pray? Mm -hmm. um, that was a tough one for me to get adjusted to because mm -hmm. we're, we're not taught that. Oh, well, we're not. But this whole concept of prayer from the throne of God is, is really nothing new. I, I see it in the scripture where Paul talks about speaking a word of the Spirit that didn't come out of the earthly realm, it came out of the heavenly realm. And so the whole, the, the premise of the book, the, the concept of the book is just simply this, that through uh, declarations, decrees, and prophecy, we would speak from that position that we're in with Christ today, in that complete victory, back onto circumstances that we struggle with, like when our marriage is going through a tough time, when our finances aren't up to snuff, or where there's a sickness and a disease in the family, Sometimes the struggle can overwhelm us and actually shut us down. The decree, or excuse me, the declarations are simply to express the heart of God. When I, when I declare something, I'm saying from God's heart what his heart is for that circumstance. If I've got a, a marriage that's struggling and I teach a couple how to pray for their marriage as God's heart would come through their mind, it would be a declaration. A decree is just simply appropriating what Christ did on the cross, mm -hmm. uh, the death and resurrection, that victory where something of darkness needs to be broken. And then the prophetic part of that is to simply pray from those real-time words the Spirit would give you for that circumstance that would just come in that moment and rise up and you'd, you'd speak those out as a prayer. And it really added to my prayer life a dimension that started about 30 years ago when we were in a struggle in the ministry. Uh, some things took place where some folks did some horrible things and we just were young pups. We didn't know what to do. So yeah. we began to do this in ignorance of what we were doing and it developed over over our lifetime to become actually the essence of what we do in prayer. You know, we're living in a day where <clears throat> I don't think we've ever had to defend our faith like we're doing mm -hmm. now. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, we were very comfortable in church. Yep. Um, and we really didn't have to take it to work Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Now it's the talk at the water cooler. And uh, all of a sudden we find ourselves back on our knees praying a whole nother level mm -hmm. of intensity than we've ever prayed mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And I think what's being stripped away here is we're realizing all the things we don't need. Right. And what we really do need is a relationship with Christ. Scripture says all things will be shaken until the relationship between you and mm -hmm. God cannot be shaken. So mm -hmm. he's shaken finances, yeah. relationships, theology. 
uh, bad training, mm -hmm. uh, everything's being shaken until you come down to a relationship that can't be shaken. But I still think that we avoid the prayer closet. Mm -hmm. We go everywhere but there, and that, that's where it happens. I think we pray a lot of times out of desperation, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to, we need to begin praying not out of desperation, but out of that place of a completed victory. When Christ died and rose again, and was seated at the right hand of the Father, that was not just a theological posturing, that was a place through which all the church would do would be sourced. So on the, I, I just came through the Easter season, and I told our church in Medford, I said, uh, the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, but the throne is occupied. Now, we have none of these without all of these. So the throne is occupied because there's an empty cross and an empty tomb, and while we look at the cross and the tomb on Easter, I think we also need to look at what the dynamic is of that position at the right hand of the Father because it's, it's huge. It's an unexplored territory that if I begin to feed off of who I am in Christ, as we say sometimes, we are in our becoming who we already are, mm -hmm. that if I begin to feed off of that position that I've got in Christ and bring that down into a marriage and dealing with kids and uh, church ministry and, and civic issues, I begin to pray with hope of transformation and it, it changes even the, the tenor of our prayers. When I begin to pray for, uh, for example, your interest in politics, when you begin to pray for a politician from the throne of God, your, the tone of your prayer will absolutely sound different, and actually the one being prayed for will want to hear more of that because it's a dimension that this earth does not express unless it's imported from heaven. Now, you're talking really some New Testament church stuff here mm -hmm. as a result of the book of Acts, mm -hmm. where the church was born as a result of the, the indwelling of the Spirit. And I've been reading, uh, as I shared with you before we went on the air, Jim Symbola's books again. Right. And he deals with the concept that uh, we bring so many preconceived ideas into our mm -hmm. Christian experience. And really, the whole act of Pentecost is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. And it, yet we put all these other things into it. But when you, what I'm hearing you say here is that you have to hear from God in your spirit first before you can pray into the situation. So there's kind of like a dual communication going yes. on here. Well, that's what Jesus modeled. He said, I do what I see the Father doing, and I speak what I hear the Father saying. And I, as I told you earlier, as I read through the book of Acts, they really didn't pray for sick people. They commanded healing. So they heard something that they spoke into this room. They just weren't uh, reaching out into the air. They heard the Lord say something to them. They'd walk by the man uh, at the gate beautiful uh, mm -hmm. for years maybe and here's this guy who's sick there and this one day they come by and the spirit says interact with this man and God downloads healing to this man or that concept could be taken into any area of our life where we have to tune ourselves to actually hear what the Lord says I think some of the mistakes that we make as pastors and parishioners or whatever the definition is is that we talk out of our own knowledge instead of the revelation of the Lord and much of what God wants to do in our cultures our revelations waiting to be spoken. And if God could just get us to be quiet long enough in contemplative prayer to hear his voice and then carry that into the day, when that moment comes that we're supposed to speak, we're speaking with something that just moments ago was in that unpolluted place of heaven. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> it's beautiful. I would have, when I was reading your book, I realized my spirit wasn't quiet enough mm -hmm. to hear what God wanted me to pray. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, prayer, prayer is kind of a circular right. thing going on. It goes up, it gets kind of mm -hmm. pollinated and comes back down, <laughs> I guess. I don't know what else to say it is, you know. Uh, but uh, I, w I couldn't, I was praying from my feelings and my mm -hmm. gut and my desires. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't listening, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not saying I'm really good at that now, right. but I am learning that as a result of your book. I, I think what you just touched on, Perry, is, is a critical element in prayer. Some of the most powerful prayers that we pray are prayers of silence. And what I mean by that is just resting in the ability to be in the Father's arms, uh, to come into His presence and say, Lord, I've just prayed it all, and I just need to rest here in Your presence. And I, and I know that that doesn't seem active to us, but it's very, very active. Uh, whenever The word believe, if you, if you study it in the original language, sometimes it's translated to entrust. In other words, when I believe God, I entrust myself, my circumstances to Him. In other words, I'm not looking for resolution or outcomes. I'm entrusting myself to Him. And when I do that, I'm in a place where there's rest. In other words, my Father has this in His hands, 
and I've done everything that I can. Now I'm just going to wait for what he's going to do that produces a peace uh, that sometimes I don't carry. I, I, I want the outcome to come out the way I think it should be and play God. And whenever I do that, I have no peace at all. I want to deal with the subject of, of the prophetic. It's just the word prophetic is a word that we're hearing more and more today, but mm-hmm. let's, let's be very elementary about that. Okay. Now, um, you're, you're Pentecostal by tradition, mm-hmm. and, and I say that to be descriptive. I understand. You understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We brothers, we get along with that. But uh, the, the whole thing prophetic, because your prayer adventure here is you have to hear it in order to pray it, and mm-hmm. in that, there's a prophecy. Yeah. So let's go back to what do you mean by prophetic? Well, Paul said, um, my favorite illustration of what prophetic means is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 3, to encourage, to exhort. Um, it's, it's something that God will give to you that will have you leave that circumstance feeling that God has empowered the situation. In other words, when I speak to you, if I were to speak to you in a, uh, without the Elizabethan English and listen, my child, and I'm not demeaning anybody that yeah. s- says yeah. it that way, but it's just the natural conversation of the kingdom of God. So our realm that we live in here is not yet fully redeemed. The rocks are crying out. They're groaning. The civilization, or excuse me, the uh, created order is groaning because mm-hmm. they want to see the sons of God revealed. Whenever I speak a prophetic word to somebody, I'm speaking a word that will encourage them to see their life from the perspective of heaven. So for me, the clearest definition of of prophecy is to give somebody the ability to see their life from the perspective of God. You ever ever, um, fear getting it wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you do with it? (laughs) Uh, For me, just my model of ministry is I submit stuff to people. I don't don't, uh, add a thus saith the Lord. I I don't do that. I say, I'm just kind of getting this sense from the Holy Spirit, I, let me let me just share this to you. And I serve it on a plate. And I say, you know, the old timers say, chew the chicken and spit out the bones. Yeah. I'm delivering this to you. Not all of this is God. It's it's some of this is going to be me. But in this word is a word of encouragement for yeah. you. Because yeah. that should be affirmation. Yeah, it of what be God's affirm- already telling you. Now, sometimes people have turned themselves off so much to God they haven't heard God in a long time. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to them, the veil is torn. They hear it, and it's almost like the first time. Yeah. And in that moment, then they take that word and they compare it to their life and they make those adjustments. Um, it, it, it's encouraging to receive healthy prophecy. It's discouraging to receive things that would be motivating to make you change your life because I want you to change and I use a prophetic word to do it. Uh, the concept of uh, getting into God's mind from, from heaven and then praying back into the situation like I said, when I was reading your book, it took me a little while to get my head around that. But once I got the idea, I thought, well, you know, duh. <laughs> and then, um, but that kind of praying, um, it, I guess, could we call it prophetic praying? It would have a real essence of that, yes. Um, suggests miraculous outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, and out of that comes the word miracles. I, I, I've been asking mm-hmm. the Lord a couple of things. And one is, not that anybody would create a ministry from but it's time to see some miracles Mm -hmm. i mean the church uh in the book of acts grew as a result of miraculous things that Mm -hmm. god just did and he did it through people who were willing to let him use Mm -hmm. it and if you read some of our mail here pastor people are hurting they need miracles in their life so hopefully a prophetic prayer sets up the scenario maybe for a miracle in their life. You want to comment on that? Yeah, um, anything that we do, especially things like uh, prophetic ministry, but any kind of ministry, the essence of it that makes it valid is this issue. Did it point me to Jesus? If it pointed me to a man, it's not valid. It has to point to Christ. My, my favorite uh, illustration of what you're talking about would be John the Baptist in prison. John's the guy who saw the heavens open The dove came down, the voice of God spoke, Jesus was affirmed at the baptism. If anybody saw supernatural things, it would be John. So John goes into prison, and in just days, his head would be severed from his body, served as a macabre uh, party favor for a dancer. He's in in the jail, and he's starting to question Jesus. I'm thinking, John, why'd you question? Because you saw this heavenly light show. If anybody ever needed a miracle, 
to see it, to believe you would be it. Now, why are you, why are you asking the question? Or yeah, you the one? Right. So he sends the disciples, you know the story. Jesus sends the answer back. Of, of, the, of the answer Jesus would send back to validate the ministry of Jesus on earth, he said this, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised, and the gospels preached to the poor. He just didn't say we had a great altar call Sunday, but he said this kingdom of earth is being transformed by the miraculous presence of my ministry. Of all the things he could send back to John to affirm a guy who's going to die so that he could die in peace and not waste his life, wow. John, here's the evidence of what I did on earth. And anything less than what Jesus did is not what Jesus wants us to do. All right. Uh, if you want to join the conversation, seven seven six five three six eight. Let's go to the phones. Hi, Paula. You have a question today? Um, yes, I do. I, I actually haven't read the book yet, and it sounds like it's um, praying for other people. But I'm wondering how praying in the Spirit fits into the picture of your prayer life. Great question. In your opinion. Oh, I great, love it. Great question. Uh, Paul said he prayed in tongues more than anybody else. I, don't, I can't claim that, but I, I don't know of a day that goes by that I don't pray in the Spirit. Uh, it would amaze you at how many visible national religious leaders every day pray in the Spirit. But unfortunately, we've created an environment that's somewhat hostile to them coming out and saying, you know, I do this every day. Yeah. So I don't even go there anymore. What I do, though, is there are times when I pray, I just have finished my prayer list, and I just, I want the Spirit of God to pray through me in ways that are beyond my understanding. And I believe when I do this, is that during the day, the literal interpretation of that will sometimes come out in those words that I speak in a known language to another human being. That it's not just an, an edification personally, and it is all of that, but there are things that are stored up and built. And one of the things in the, in the book that I talk about are prayers that loiter. Mm -hmm. Uh, how modern missiles can actually go and loiter in a valley adjacent to another valley in Afghanistan for 24 hours, and then the computers send them over the mountain and they blow the place up. Some of these prayers that we pray actually have have loitered, and, and these prayers in the Spirit can do the same kinds of thing. God says, I just want you to start praying because an event's going to take place. And the bulls of heaven, as Revelation talks about, I think some of those prayers are prayers in the Spirit, prayers in the known language, in any form of prayer that the Bible validates. All right. Does that help you, Paula? Thank you. Yeah, right. thank you. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, 776-5368. Uh, give us a call, 776-5368. Pastor Garris Elkins with us today talking about his book, Prayers from the Throne of God. Um, praying in the Spirit, I, I guess it's interpreted many ways. You just gave one, but isn't, did you say all prayers is Spirit-led or not? Oh, absolutely. I mean, every prayer that we utter uh, it should be Spirit-led and Spirit-empowered. I think also God delights in the fact of me just saying, I want to pray to you. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Prayers, the Spirit will, uh, the old-timers give us, uh, said, give us an unction. Mm -hmm. Okay, remember that word? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the unction of the Holy Spirit will yeah. come. But there's times I think we need to have an understanding of our relationship with God. There's some things I'm going to initiate. Mm -hmm. I just want to say today, God, I love you. Now, I know the Spirit within me hungers for me to say that, so I'm saying it because there's this, this Spirit of God in me that's causing me to, to hunger for what God hungers for. But I think all prayer is by the Spirit, but I think the Bible, uh, and I have to just use the Word of God as my evidence point, huh. the Bible does talk about prayer in your known language and prayer in a language that's not known. But it's become kind of a badge, and I think I, I came out of the Jesus movement, and it became a bizarre badge for validating people, right. and I think God got all grieved about that. You know, you made an interesting point, because I have talked to people that would be shocked uh, if it was public to know that they... Yeah, I have uh, too. You know, so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, and but, I totally <laughs> understand what you're saying. For, uh, for protection, but uh, you know, when you're, when you're just really sincere in your presence before God... Uh, things happen in the supernatural. I mean, I think of the Mount Transfiguration. Yeah. I mean, he went from the natural to the spiritual, back to the natural. There's something there. Yeah. You know, so uh, I want to talk about miracles. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you believe in them? Yes, sir. I do. Have you experienced them? I have. Like how? Uh, I've seen people physically healed. I've seen marriages healed, not through counseling, but through revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've seen miracles, uh, the great miracles of, of a heart that was hard to turn, to become soft to the things of God. I've, I've seen, I saw a leg grow out one time, freaked me out. Yeah. I just thought it was, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I've seen, I remember when I was a, 
a young cop just getting into the things of God. A tree fell on a guy, and me and this other, uh, he was a fireman. We uh, were going to the same church, and we didn't know anything about this, but this guy was really hurting, big, horrible bruise. We laid hands on him, and I saw before my eyes it all go away, and he got up and walked away. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I believe in that, and I, I'd love to see more of that in my life. Now, I want to come back to one of them, yeah. <clears throat> the one of the hardened heart. Yeah. Um, that's the cause for a lot of divorces. Mm -hmm. That's the cause for a lot of people to walk away right. from God. That's the cause of just about every eruption we got going right. with relationships. And uh, um, how do we pray for a hardened heart? That, that's the biggest deal, I think, in the earth today is a hard heart. Because I think the hard heart shuts down the ability for the tenderness of God to move through us. I think... Is it ego-driven? I, 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 think, I think it's multifaceted. Yeah. That's like when Jesus said, um, he was talking about divorce. He says, divorce is not a sin. Hardness of heart was a sin. Mm -hmm. When I was a cop, I used to go into a place and somebody would have shot the, a bullet through their head and I walk in and the body's dead. Obviously dead, I've seen enough of them. But I had to wait for a coroner to put a certificate of death on that dead body. Now the divorce is just a certificate that something died. Mm -hmm. What killed it was a hardness of heart. So we spent a lot of time getting fluffed up in the body of Christ about divorce, Jesus completely went past that and said it's about the hardness of heart. So if I close my heart off to you and become hardened to you, there's another thing that's taking place in me. I've hardened myself to God because my horizontal bro brokenness reflects a vertical brokenness. Mm. Yeah, it's a big deal. All right. Uh, how do we pray? I mean, I realize that effective prayer comes from total submission. You know, I mean, we have to be surrendered right. to God so he can talk. I mean, especially when, <laughs> if we're going to go up and get his mind on the situation yeah. and then pray from heaven back down to the situation. But there are those people that we all have them in our lives. Their, their heart's hard. Yeah. And if, if we don't pray for them, who will? I got a story for you. Okay. <laughs> okay, and I'll try to make it quick. All right. Jan and I are on a train coming back from Eastern Europe to our home in Berlin when we lived there before we came here 12 years ago. Uh, we got a first-class train cabin, which was just a few pennies more, because we wanted to sleep. We'd been on the road for a week. Knock on the door, a guy stand in front of the door to come into the compartment. And I go, darn it, because I wanted to just stretch out. Yeah. He comes in, and we good and talk, good and talk. We say hello to each other. Um, he's dressed, he's wearing more clothing and value than I make in a month. I mean, mm -hmm. the guy was a multimillionaire, had uh, factories in the east and the west. Came in, first 30 minutes, the guy's just telling me how great he is. And I'm just listening, back and forth. Then he realizes, you know, I'm being rude, I need to ask you what you do for a living. Well, I typically defer that one about being a pastor slash missionary at the time, because I just like to relate to people differently. This time, Lord said, tell him exactly what you do. I said, I'm a pastor. Well, boom, the wall went down. This guy, for the next 15 minutes, told me I was the most stupid human he ever met in a life to believe in a God and blah, blah, blah. Halfway through that... 10, 15 minutes of a diatribe. He's coming on real strong. Uh, the Lord says, tell him this. Tell him that I love him and I forgive him. I held my hand up and says, can I interrupt you for a second? The Lord just said for me to tell you that God loves you and he forgives you. In that moment, I saw something I've never seen before. I saw tears squirt literally six inches out before they started their arc down. He began to weep like a baby, and I'm going, okay, Lord, what's this all about? He went in to tell me that he had studied for the ministry, that he had a failure in his life, and he thought God didn't love him. That was 30 years ago. He launched out into business, became a multi-bazillionaire, married a woman from an Asian country, and built a temple for her in western Germany where they live. Wow. He had all the success and the money of the world, but he didn't have the word of the Lord that says, I love you, and I haven't given up on you. Wow. So that's, that's this element here. Who's that available to? To any believer, any of us that would just in that circumstance just hear the voice of the Lord. You don't study for it. You don't get a degree for it. You just cultivate uh, his presence. And sometimes I don't cultivate his presence, and he still speaks to me. Well, you know, it's interesting because when Peter and John were going to the temple to pray, and there was the beggar at the gate, <clears throat> uh, the gate beautiful, um, this was before the prayer meeting. This was before they were yeah. in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. I mean, they're on their way to go mm -hmm. get into the presence of the Lord. Right. So they hadn't come from one. They were going to one. Yeah. And silver and gold we don't have, but such as we have, we're going to give it to you. Um, and they were criticized because they weren't educated. They weren't the Sadducees and the Pharisees right. and all that stuff. So 
Um, I just, I guess what I'm looking for, can that return? Because America and families is broken, mm -hmm. and we need to see God again. I, I really, really believe that there's got to be some kind of an outpouring again. I think we, we, we have a mistake in America, in American churches. We pray for, uh, for the byproducts to happen instead of the event. Right. Uh, so we'll pray for revival. I think we need to, that's a byproduct of the event. The event is that we've had an encounter with Jesus and that he's touched us, he's forgiven us on a personal level. So that couple that's going through just the hell of life, they need to know more than anything that word that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 3, to encourage, to exhort, to have them come alongside the promise of God and let the reality of heaven that will remain after this is all transformed, bring them into that reality there and say, this is how God sees you. This is Afternoon, afternoon. on the Dove. Okay, we're back, and uh, Afternoon's on the Dove, and our special guest today, Pastor Garris Elkins. He's a pastor of the Living Water Foursquare Church here in Medford, and um, written a book called Prayers from the Throne of God, and we have a couple of these we'll be giving away here coming up in just a few moments. A very beautiful um, and, and tremendous resource if you are... Um, interested in learning more about the subject of prayer, which automatically should be a part of all of our lives, Pastor, but I think we all struggle with it at times. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started reading your book, and I go, okay, Garris, where'd you go with this, you know? <laughs> and I came back, and I read it again, and I thought, okay, now I'm getting it. And the concept is that you would get, instead of praying from here to here, mm -hmm. you're going to get to heaven and pray back down. Out of your dual citizenship. As a dual, a dual citizenship. And I thought, man, this is really something so... Anyway, that's what the book deals with, and we're going to give it away. But let's go to the phones first. Amelia, I want to get your phone call in. What's on your mind today? Uh, how can I help a friend who has terminal cancer to face this from heaven's point of view, as you spoke of earlier? Is the person a believer? Yes. Then I would begin to talk with them in two aspects. Uh, one, I would never give up on prayer for the healing of that person. We're mandated to just pray. But secondly, I would, I would ask you to begin to talk about heaven with that person so that yes. as, as they live this life, they're in peace of the outcome. Because I think as a believer, you and I will never actually experience death. And here's what I mean. Yes. The Bible says to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Absolutely. And the, there's no sting and victory in the grave and death anymore. So when, when we die, the beauty of that will be that you and I will be able to uh, come to a place in the passage of life to death where we're going to say, I didn't even know how I got into your presence, Jesus. I just, I just got here. How did this happen? And the joy of our death, if I can use that kind of a phrase, mm -hmm. the joy of our death will be this, is that I didn't know how I stood in front of you, Jesus, but here you are. There's no tunnel. There's no uh, Hollywood movie star telling me that I'm going to believe in uh, crystals. It's just, I got here. How did I get here? And, and the Lord would say, that's part of the joy. So I would tell you to contend for her healing and pray for that, but secondly, just introduce her to a greater vision of heaven. And a uh, reminder of her dual citizenship. Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's what Paul said. He said, you're dual citizens. You live here in this life, but you're also seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father, and that brings great hope to people. Thinking of the scripture found in um, Psalm 116, I, I was just reading it here, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Mm -hmm. I think we forget that uh, mm -hmm. we don't like it, mm -hmm. but... Heaven gains, you know. I think God loves to be with his children in whatever way, and I just it shows the heart of God. I, I'm, I'm more into scriptures now that reveal his heart than I am of any other scripture. I want to know the heart of God, because the heart of God will determine how I pray. Mm -hmm. If God is still angry, if the cross wasn't enough to solve his wrath or satisfy his wrath, right. then if I still see him in an old covenant shadow image instead of the reality we see him now, then this God can't be good. All right, now you're touching on another topic. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a day where everything just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think the mess that the world is in is because of man doing what he thought was yep. the right thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we left God out and things are a mess. Now there's a hunger. Yes. And I'm even seeing a new hunger even among believers. I was mm -hmm. like, well, wait a minute. I believe, but do I know? Mm -hmm. And there's a hunger now to know. Are you sensing that? Yeah, for the unbeliever, <clears throat> it's a hunger for the unknown. But for the believer, it's a hunger for the known. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I think we as believers should lead the hunger parade. In other words, we should be the most hungry people for the presence of God. The world, 
that doesn't know him yet, they're hungering for something that, like Paul said in Romans, you were created to worship. You were created to love God. They don't know what that's about. Now, when we come and we manifest a hunger for God, they look at that, and their hunger then begins to cry out for that meal. And then it just becomes a natural byproduct to, to share wh what this hunger is. Our hunger comes from being satisfied. See, that, that, that's a concept that we think our hunger is from the lack of food. Our hunger is more of what we've already been given. And if I'm, if I'm hungering for things that I don't think I possess, then that's going to be short-circuited, and I'm going to die of malnutrition. But I've already been fed the feast, and I'm now asking for more of the feast. Mm. Um, what do we, how do we properly, if I can use the word yeah. correctly, channel this hunger? Because sometimes we will go back to traditions to that's feed right. it, mm -hmm. and uh, that, doesn't get, that just frustrates mm -hmm. us even more. How do, we, how do we focus the hunger in the right direction? Well, here, I'll give a personal example. <clears throat> it was about uh, two months ago. I was just going through a really dry week. I mean, I was just dry. No, you're a pastor. You're yeah, not right, supposed to be baloney. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those weeks where if you <laughs> hugged me, I was a powder puff. You know? um, and the Lord gave me a picture about what he wanted me to live my next season of life like. He says, I don't want you to throw away the traditions because you'd mentioned traditions and liturgy. They're wonderful. Those are tent pegs behind me. Those need to be secure because they help me understand where I've come from. But the Lord showed me this picture. He says, I want you to pick up the two tent pegs in front of you. Leave those two in the back. Pick up these and start running. I just want you to run into my presence and expand the canopy of my presence. And he was talking about this valley, actually. That the history that we have is critical because we have to evaluate issues on our history. But we're to run into the future without planting. The minute we plant those tent pegs ahead of us, we've determined that's as far as God can take what he's doing. And I think the tent pegs in front of us are going to be planted in eternity. Well, there's Isaiah 54. Enlarge your uh, place of your tent. Stretch. I read it that week. <laughs> <laughs> stretch your tent curtains wide and don't hold back. Lengthen yeah. your cords. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. It's an expanding presence of God upon the earth where the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdom of our Lord. All right. Um, you're obviously in preaching mode, and I'm going to take advantage I'm of it. For it but you, you gave me a mic, and this is dangerous. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is good. This is good. And if you have any questions uh, for Garris, we've got a few moments. Uh, seven seven six five three six eight. Um, just take a few moments uh, from this experience of writing this book and getting your hunger satisfied and giving hope to the person who is hopeless. I think one of the most um, mind-boggling things that we deal with here at mm -hmm. the Dove is the phone calls that we're getting from believers. Mm -hmm. They believe, mm -hmm. but they have no hope. And it almost sounds like an oxymoron, but it, it, it's happening. Yeah. They believe, but they don't have any hope. Well, I, I think um, part of that I touch on the book about the anchor, uh, Hebrews 6, the anchor of our hope that's in heaven. Mm -hmm. That if, if, our, if our hope is here primarily, we will live a hopeless life. We will have a life that is anchored to transitory, changing unsettled events. But if our, if our hope is anchored in heaven, then I can hold on by faith to a rope to that anchor. And no matter what's taking place, there's where I'm going. That's what's going to take place. Now, I don't, I don't live in a, in a mindset that says I'm just going to live for that only, but I'm going to bring that back here. I'm going to, I'm going to say to a wife or say to a husband, you're depressed. You haven't worked in two years. Um, I just, I just want to encourage you that you are a good husband, that the provision of our family is not on your shoulders. I, I take it off of your shoulders and put it back on God's shoulders. God says that he's the one that cares for our needs. I just show up. In fact, the ministry of showing up, I think, is, is underrated. Just show up. If you're unemployed, show up and do the best you can in that moment. But the outcome of your employment is not your, in your lap. It's in the hands of God. How do we... Uh... How do we just um, give up and say, okay, God, you do it. I obviously can't. Because I think part of the problem is we, we're still trying to insert right. ourselves and yeah. insert our will or insert, you know, we want God to do it this way, yeah. and then that will prove his existence to us. I think that happens in multi-levels. I think uh, every day is a day of surrender. I, I know in my own life, I, I, as a young pastor, I used to think I knew a lot, but now the older I am in the ministry... I know less of God. So mm. I said the other day, what do you mean by that? I said, he's gotten a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as, as, I, as I listen to people struggle with, with, like the dear lady that called her friend in terminal diseases and mm -hmm. people that are in financial issues, it always is pointing them back 
to Jesus. And somebody says, well, I, that's not enough. If that's not enough, then you've got another issue going on. It's got to always be about him. Jesus, somebody said, is perfect theology. If you want an answer to all of life's questions, go to the red ink in the, in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Read the red ink. In fact, I did that one time for a month. Read nothing but the red words. And I didn't read any of the black words around it. And I thought, if we could gather our theologies, our politics, our doctrines, our life from just the red words and use the rest of the Bible to explain the red words, then I think we'd be a lot healthier. Well, that's good advice. Um, what, what, uh, what do you see um, uh, as the greatest challenge of being a pastor today? Believing that God is good and that God has good plans for your personal future. I mean, as a pastor, are you yeah, conveying yeah. that to your person? No, to me. To you? Yeah, to me as a well, pastor. Well, you as a pastor, you're uh, supposed to be on top of things. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you've been in the ministry, you know what it's like. I think, uh, I think for me, it's just believing the, the goodness of God. Um, that's, the, that's the turning hinge point especially when stuff is not working out or you might, you know, as a, as a word merchant, a pastor, you say things from the pulpit, sometimes off the cuff mm -hmm. uh, or even planned, and they contain nothing of the heart of God. Yeah. And they're just part of a message. Yeah. And you can hurt somebody's feelings or you can walk by somebody and have something on your mind and not pay attention to somebody in a life crisis or not notice it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't your intent. You're just caught up in your own life. But I think for me, it's the goodness of God. If I can know he's good. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. We're going to give a couple of your books away. What do you want people to get from your book? I know what I got from it. What do you want, what do you want them to get out of this? That there's more. There's, there's more. more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, more in what? More in who God is in their life. All right. We have two of the books to give away. I want to give them to college number three and four. A uh, tremendous resource. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. You're going to read it. And then you're going to put it down, and then you're going to pick it up again. <laughs> and it's going to walk you through some really uh, incredible encouragement. Um, Gareth Stank, will you come back? I'd love to. Thank you. And uh, I just I want to continue to pursue this, this subject of encouraging people to believe for the miraculous mm -hmm. again. Okay. You know, um, I, I'm really, really concerned about that. I, I really want people to know that God does do miracles. He does answer prayers. And he may not do it the way you want him, but in the end, they'll get answered. Maybe know? the next time we get together, we'll talk about the transferable Pentecost. The whole church was born in Pentecost and how it's become so monolithic that some of the body doesn't think it belongs to them. And that monolithic theology of Pentecost doesn't belong to everybody. It's just one way to do it. I think there's a huge body picture that we need to have of what Pentecost truly means. Well, we just came through uh, Pentecost yep. Sunday, yep. and I never heard so many sermons on it cross-denominationally yeah. on um, this station. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to the various denominations. I thought, well, maybe mm -hmm. we're coming back to well, I think we the are. basics. You know? I think we're already at the doorstep of what you just said. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Will you come back and talk about I'd it? I'd love to. All right. Here's Elkton with us today. Again, uh, Living Water Church, your address real quick. 2200 Roberts Road. Medford. And your service times? Uh, 8.30 and 10.30 Sunday. Okay. Boys. He's a good guy. He's a cool preacher. Go visit him. Thank you, pal. Thank you, God bless you. God bless you. See you next time. Right. We'll Bye. see you. See you tomorrow.